Good morning and welcome to Snow Hills Sunday online Bible study for Sunday, April the 11th. Paul, do you know what Sunday, April the 11th is? I mean, you have any idea what it is? Man, it's uh, the Sunday after Easter. See, folks, I've got him stumped. It doesn't happen often. He's the brightest guy I know. <laughs> Easter is high Sunday because everyone comes to Easter, but we're so tired after Easter that the Sunday after Easter is called low Sunday. So if you've stayed home because it's low Sunday, thank you for joining us with, uh, for Bible study this morning on low Sunday. And... Um, we're not out to shame you or guilt you. We just didn't know if you knew that trivia. I didn't till a few years ago. And I thought, what a great crowd on Easter Sunday. And then it's like, where did everybody go? Where'd they go? So now I know that's what happens. Anyway, good morning. Say good morning, Paul. Good morning. We are uh, on week well, chapter number five, as we're working through Philip Carey's little book, Good News for Anxious Christians. Now, we, I, we tried to find ways to persuade you to get your own copy of this book. And if you have, fantastic. You have understood its value. But today's opportunity to share scripture together and think through uh, one of the what we don't have to do is that Carey has here uh, is worth the entire book. And so while we think we thought early on the introduction was really good, really worth buying, true enough, if you, if you like could bring yourself to it, chapter five is worth buying the entire book. And um, so there you have it. So since now, now you're so curious and so anxious and ready to get to it, why don't we pray and we'll get rolling. Lord God, thanks uh, this morning for an opportunity to uh, share Scripture and then reflect on the things that make Christians anxious, as described by uh, Professor Carey. And we trust that you'll grant us some wisdom and insight, some discernment and some understanding, that by the time we're through, we will conclude that the more important thing we think about is that love always looks for and seeks the good. And uh, so make that uh, something that we kind of uh, at least get to in our conversations and that you get into us by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to take and read a verse from Galatians that um, uh, Mr. Carey gets at to the end. And we'll use that to emphasize a, a, a constant ongoing theme, and then uh, we'll work back into kind of walking through uh, his, his statement that says, why you don't have to be sure you have the right motivations. Why you don't have to be sure you have the right motivations, subtitled, or how love seeks the good. And it's so good, by the way. So Galatians 3, 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, one of the things that that uh, uh, Carrie is uh, trying to stay uh, on target with, one of his emphases that just seems to show up as he addresses each of these things he's identified as anxieties that Christians face is that our formation comes from the outside of us, that it comes from, it's, it's external, we would say. It's, it's not internal. So we don't have to go find ourselves. So some of you are my age and older, maybe, maybe as young as Paul. Ha -ha. Um, you remember that period of time where, you know, you face this moment and, and, and it was kind of an old cliche in the 60s and 70s. I've got to go find myself. And what that meant was I got to look inside and in there, I'd find all the answers. And when that, that become the, became the emphasis, really what we found inside was we just weren't what, sure what we found. Sometimes we didn't like what we found. And so Carrie's rightly emphasizing what the apostle Paul does is that formation, that is the, the shaping of our hearts and our lives comes externally as we're exposed to the goodness of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And, and so 
while we do have the language of uh, being indwelled by God's spirit, the, the realities are that the truth we're looking for is outside of us. It's, it's, it's external to us. It's not internal. And so, Paul, can you, can you kind of maybe help us? You're really good at giving some descriptions of, of kind of how we might receive that imagery, how, how we might receive that picture. Um, so so what, what are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, um, to begin with, I would say that, you know, I think you really laid the table well about those questions from the 60s and 70s, finding ourselves and looking within. And honestly, uh, it, whether it's the 60s and 70s or whether it's 2021, if anyone goes looking inside, uh, in fact, folks out there may want to pause a minute and look inside and tell me what you see. Tell me what's there. Um, because uh, I, I would bet that if we were at a round table right now and the folks that were listening in uh, could interact, and, and by the way, feel free to uh, type your answer or, or response into the comment section. Um, we'd love to see that and, and see your interaction. But my suspicion is that we would be able to come up with some really generic responses to that, but nothing very specific. I mean, we might say, well, I look in myself and I find um, sinfulness, or I look in myself and I find discontentment, or maybe I look in myself and I find happiness. Um, but, but the specifics would be very difficult to come by and it reminds me a little bit of what we talked about last week and what he wrote about in the last chapter when he gives us an example of a basketball player like Michael Jordan who can just by second nature um, was able to, to know when to pass, where to pass. Um, you know, Magic Johnson could do the no-look pass. He just knew where his teammate was going to be. Yeah, some of it was instinctive maybe, but a lot of it was just from practicing together over and over and playing together over and over again, and uh, each one knowing what the other was going to do. But Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, great players like that did not become great players by looking inside and saying, I'm going to concentrate inwardly to develop basketball intuition. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, it, you loved playing basketball a good bit of your life. I have always enjoyed playing it. Had to quit a number of years ago because my body just told me it was time. Amen. Uh, but um, when, when you're playing and, and all of that, uh, you can sit around and you can you can mentally go through plays and think, what do I do in this situation? What do I what do I do in that situation? But the fact is, you're on the court with four other guys on your team, and then five others that aren't on your team, and you can't predict what any one of them are going to do at any time. And the only way that you can figure that out is by getting out there on the court with them. You're not going to navel gaze and figure out how to become a great basketball player because if you could, I would have been really awesome. <laughs> but you just can't. Uh, you have to get out there and you have to practice and you have to play. And you, it, it's, it's as you were saying, it's external to yourself. It happens on the court. It doesn't happen by looking inwardly. It happens by practicing outwardly. And sometimes you throw an errant pass. It goes out of bounds. It goes to the wrong player, something like that. But all of that gets honed over time because of your external interaction with others around you. And I would say that's a, a great metaphor for what he's talking about here, that a, a lot of times when, when we think about our motivation, well, we just start looking inwardly. What is my motivation? And uh, one great thing that he talks about in the chapter is that one of the things that we want to avoid is a selfish motivation. And so how do we do that? 
well, we look inside ourselves. Well, isn't that self-centered? <laughs> so now, <laughs> now we have come full circle on ourselves. You don't become outwardly focused by focusing inwardly on yourself. <laughs> and uh, so I think that was um, uh, something that really stood out to me in this chapter is, um, and that you emphasize at the beginning, uh, it, it really all happens out kind of in the world, in, in life, uh, where we live with others and we practice them. And um, a, as I was reading through uh, that section of his book, one of the things that I was thinking of, a, a thought came to my mind and it was, is there ever, uh, is it ever wrong to do the right thing? So let's say that I'm driving down the road and I see someone uh, stopped off to the side of the road and they've got a flat tire and it looks like they're having trouble with it. Maybe they've never changed a flat tire before. And of course, these days, uh, the jacks that come with cars, uh, I think you need an engineering degree to figure out how those work anyway. Um, and, and so you, you kind of see them fumbling around and, and unsure of what to do. And it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be odd if, if I'm trying to decide in that moment, what should I do? Well, the, and so I ask myself, well, now, if, if you, Paul, if you pull over and stop to help, are you doing it for the right motivation? And if the answer for that is wrong, it is no. If I decide that, well, if I pull over and help them, I'm just doing it so that I can get a good attaboy or so I can feel good about myself or, or something like that, something that I might consider an improper motivation, what should I do? Just keep driving because, my, because I determined that my motivation was incorrect? And I think what Carrie would say in this chapter is uh, it's always right to do the right thing. And our motivations are always going to be imperfect and, and at least mixed. Uh, maybe we have some good mixed in with the bad, um, but wouldn't it be odd? I mean, we, we would think it was, would be really odd that the very reason that I pass by helping someone is because I'm afraid I don't have the right motivation. Mm -hmm. Well, then what he says is get out and help them fix the flat. And in the process, in the activity of getting out there and helping them fix the flat, God is at work refining your motivations for why you do things like that. Mm. And he's at work in the world showing his love through you to someone else as you are, are helping them out. Yeah, so. and, and, if, and, and, and if you we look, in, we do that inward gaze, and we find that our motivation is what we'd say is less than noble, we repent of that. that. That is, yes, we get out and help, and then after we're done, after we realize how it's formed and shaped us to express God's love to another, whether we know them or not, like them or not, we repent of those that, whatever it was, you could, we want to call it motivation or a poor attitude or whatever you want to. It's always good to repent because then it reminds us. It reminds us that God is always working to form and shape us. If we don't change our mind about those things, then it's what's really going to require is you're just going to change a lot more tires. And, and I don't, I mean, that's, a tad bit tongue in cheek and humorous, but since we are formed externally by demonstrating the choice to always do the good, the best, uh, in that moment of decision making, uh, maybe we've had such a uh, poor past uh, performance record that it's going to take twice as long for us to figure it out. That no, wait a minute, this clothing ourselves with Christ, this putting on Christ, as Paul calls it, is going to take us, you know, 10 tire changes instead of two tire changes before we kind of, oh, second nature, right, best thing to do, let's do it. And I think the one thing that I thought was really helpful that, that Carrie pointed out is, is repentance is a way of looking inward and seeing us as we are. So, um, when we start looking inwardly, 
we can become paralyzed in the back and forth between um, is the angel on my right shoulder going to win out over the devil on my left shoulder? And, and that is a, that's a paralyzing moment. Uh, but if we're, you know, going to do the best good, next best good thing, and we're convicted that, hey, I should have had a better attitude about that, stop and repent about it, because it's a recognition that God is forming you to what we want to call, you know, what he calls, actually, Christian duty. And for, for Paul and I, as you've, if you've been with us any amount of time, have heard us reference Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard, uh, who uh, was a huge advocate of the 10-step program, uh, actually found in that plan uh, two things that always seem to help people. One, certainly you want to think the right way into right behavior. But the, at the same time, because that's the slowest form of transformation, we want to do the things that move us into right thinking. So it's a both and. And I remember, Paul, talking with a, a, a young fellow who had been involved in some addiction stuff. He was in the process of helping uh, someone who had come through our church a lot of years ago. So nobody would even know who it is. And we were on the phone talking and I was arguing with him. I mean, I was arguing, having read Willard too, I was arguing with him, man, we, this is some stinking thinking here. We got to help this guy st think better. And he said to me, yes, he needs some, to learn some better thinking skills, some better critical thinking skills. No doubt about it, Todd, but that's slower. What we need to do is make sure he's busy making the best right decisions because then he's going to do his way into right thinking. That is, frankly, the discipleship method of Jesus. Yep. He, if he ever taught, it was either um, uh, preceded or uh, followed by a, a doing. Right well, and if you think side. about the, the results of that, so... Uh, very often, Jesus taught his disciples, and what was their reaction after he taught? I mean, very often, it's like, what are you talking about? I mean, we don't get it. Uh, or, or he would tell them, <laughs> you guys, you, you just don't get it yet. But he takes 70, and he sends them into various towns two by two. And what's their response to that? Was it we don't, why did you do that? No, they came back saying, Lord, look at, I mean, the, 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 even the demons listened to us, and it, it was amazing. And, you know, we've got examples like that. I think we've talked about it before, um, about how uh, our, our Wednesdays helping others has impacted our own church members. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you can sit around a table and talk about the value and, and, and the obedience and all of that of uh, being salt and light in the world in a variety of ways and, and even how that specifically fits into what Jesus is talking about there. And it can all be heady and everything. But the, the point where it really makes the difference for people is when, when they started actually getting involved in that and meeting real people and meeting their real needs in real life. And then it's like, well, you know, I know we talked about this and, and I was a little skeptical, but the doing was the very thing that changed the thinking uh, for some. And so, yeah, it, it's not either or, it's both right. and. Right. Um, but very often, it's just getting out there and doing it that um, that really gives us those where, where God uses us in those moments and, sh and and teaches us and forms us in those moments of actually getting out into the world and doing it. Yes, and the danger that Carrie's trying to highlight in this whole process is if we at any moment begin thinking about our motivation prior to doing it, in the aftermath of doing it or while doing it, where we then begin to question the other person. Are they worth it? Are they valuable? Are they making bad decisions? Then we've actually then become the same thing. In other words, we have, we have become pretty selfish in our attempts to say, well, I'm not selfish. 
I give up my Wednesday night and I, I'm, and I'm out there. I could be home. I, it's been a long day at work. I'm putting an extra hour in or two. And, and then we begin to think, I've seen those people before. Why did you see how full their trunk was? And you're going to like, immediately we start thinking about, Oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm doing that for them. Do you see hear hear that? All the verbs now are about me and what I'm doing. And it's less uh, about what, you know, I, what what love is doing for the good of another person. And that's why a subtitle, I think, is so valuable that, that how love seeks the good, that if we are really thinking about what is good and the good thing to do, then love's what's going to be the thing at work driving us to that. And we don't want to make this about self-love. That is, man, I sure love myself because I put in my time down there at Snow Hill, making sure that folks had food tonight. I mean, listen, that's not forming you in any way. And that's actually, you might as well just stay locked in on your own uh, uh, motivations and uh, just remain totally unformed uh, because that you're just exposing what's already in us. And when Jesus, remember, said what makes us unclean is what's in us. So um, this line, lo how love seeks the good, is that, Paul, that passage, that section, that little section was just um, powerful. When we are, you know, in the church uh, or in our, own, in our own lives, in our neighborhoods, are trying to determine okay, what's, what's the good thing to do? And uh, um, the, 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 the good best thing is always the thing to do. It, it, there, it, and, and there's no qualifier uh, with that. Uh, so I, I, I really think that um, this has applications uh, for not just how we do what we do with our neighbors, the good that we do, but the good that we do with our family. Uh, and, and Paul, he had another danger I thought might, might be worth us talking about, that, that we've set up this internal motivation thing and then sometimes this externally driven selfishness that really what we're after is we're, we're in a performance sort of based uh, um, moment in, in Christianity where I'm, I'm really doing these things because I want to be seen as being a good parent, a good Christian, a good church member. And, and really, if that, if that is really what's at work, we're not being any of those things because our motivation is, is what's got our, our preoccupation and not the good that needs to be done. Is that? Well, yeah. And it's that we get focused on that. We get, we, we get, you know, it's like everything that we do, the, the whole idea is that we're doing these things for others. Um, but we, we can end up, particularly when we are concerned about our own motivations, we're, we end up turning it around on ourselves. And it's, I did this good thing so that I can look like a good Christian, so that I can, and, and then, and, and then we, create these categories that, you know, I'm the good Christian and you're the not so good one. And, and we begin, Paul, we're begin fruit inspecting Paul. Now, come on, aren't we supposed to fruit inspect? Oh well, yeah. But uh, <laughs> Paul said that <laughs> if you compare yourselves with one another, you're unwise. That's exactly right. Um, and, and so it's not about setting up a category of who the good Christians are and who the bad Christians are, or as Carrie really puts it in, in the chapter is what we tend to do is we talk about what good Christians are and what good Christians do and what people who aren't Christians do. Mm -hmm. And now we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And he said, really, the gospel is an invitation to say, hey, uh, you're a sinner. Well, guess what? So am I. So uh, you, you come join us. Now, it's not an excuse to, to remain a sinner, um, it, but it is a recognition that one, we can't become paralyzed by just waiting for the perfect motivation to be in us at all times, because that's just not going to happen. As I said, we, we're always, uh, almost every motivation that we have is a mixed motivation. And I really, you know, it became helpful um, a, a number of years ago. Uh, I, 
it really made me scratch my head at first, but reading something that John Piper had written about uh, Christian hedonism is what he called it. And the point that he, he was trying to make, you know, hedonism is that, well, I'm doing things for my own pleasure. Um, Piper's uh, comment on that was that as a Christian, when we are doing the right things, when we are doing the things that please God, it results in our pleasure and that we shouldn't feel bad about that because doing the right thing, God did not intend for us doing the right thing to make us walk away going, oh, gosh, now I feel really bad. Um, but we honestly, shouldn't we feel a sense of satisfaction when we have done something well and done something good and shown love well? Um, but that's not our motivation. Our motivation isn't how I make myself look good. It's not how I please myself. Although he, he also does uh, make note of, uh, you know, the, the several places in the Bible where it says to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, we don't hate ourselves. We, we do tend to love ourselves and we want the best for ourselves. And those scriptures are telling us, well, then want for other, what you should want for others is the same that you would be wanting for yourself. Uh, so it, it's just, you know, it, honestly, it's kind of exhausting even to, uh, right now, just trying to talk about the complexity and the burden of trying to manage and monitor your motivations all the time. Mm. Sometimes it's just, you see the good thing to do and go do it. And another thing that I thought was really important that he, he points out is that sometimes we get paralyzed because we're trying to decide, well, there's the good, the better, and the best. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Sometimes it's not good, better, and best. Sometimes it's just, there's a good thing to do. And there may be multiple good things to do. Go do one of them. <laughs> right. Do, right. You know, do the good thing. Um, and, and so then that's where the foundation of what he's written up to this point comes into play. Mm -hmm. How do I know the good thing to do? Well, he t he's, he's already talked about cultivating wisdom, knowing right from wrong, knowing good from evil. Well, now as we're developing those things, as we understand the kind of life that scripture lays out for us and says, you want a good life? Here's the good life. Um, you want to know how to how to have it, here's some things to do. Well, now it's at the point that, uh, okay, you know what the good thing is, you know how to do it, but now you're arguing with yourself over what your motivations are for doing it. Well, quit, <laughs> quit, quit doing that. You've learned the right thing to do. You've got the equipment to do it. Now go do it and let that form you. Mm -hmm. And where your motivations are wrong, then repent of those and say, you know, well, apparently, you know, I, I wanted to pat myself on the back for that. But you just learn something for next time. That next time you're like, you know, maybe I can find some satisfaction in this without the pat on the back. Maybe I don't yeah. need that. Yeah. And I used to get, I, I get a confession. I, I used to kind of try to figure how to split the hairs between right and wrong, good and bad. But, but the one thing that we all understand is, is, is we learn what's good and we learn what's bad. That is, you know, when it comes to making a decision, we inherit a tr long tradition in the West that one of the things human beings ought to do is pursue the good. In other words, that's a universal emphasis. Uh, that's not strictly a Christian emphasis. It is a human encouragement because it recognizes that there's been too many illustrations of human beings choosing the bad, and the bad always results in the bad for all people, particularly people directly involved in whatever decision is made. So one of the things Kerry's doing when he says, when, when he addresses the issue of, you know, a lot of people are going to do good things. And I can hear ringing in my ear those say, well, doing good things don't make you a Christian. No, they, they, you're, that's absolutely correct. They don't make you a Christian. But the issue isn't a good, bad, right or wrong. The, 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 the issue is I know what's in me and I'm a sinner. And rather than me point my finger at someone else who I don't know is a Christian or I know isn't a Christian and say, well, I'm better than they are. Listen, uh, 
if, if the last two years have taught me anything is that there are a lot of people who are not Christian who make really good decisions, and there are Christians who make really bad decisions. And, and so if we can kind of uh, rely on the fact that God has offered some common grace to the world and an emphasis on doing good, doing the good, then it is a reminder that God is, is, is working in us to form us to be people who do, do the good. So the reason I raise that issue and go that direction is, is I had a conversation with a young friend today. I was telling Paul about it before we started. And to me, this also really helps in when we talk about helping our children, our young people when it comes to the faith. So we're always kind of concerned as Christian parents about our kids learning what faith is like and what trust is like. And so when we teach them the stories of Jesus when they're young, and then we attach to the things that Jesus does, he went about what the scripture says, doing good. And we associate those things that Jesus is doing with what is good. And then we tell our children, let's do what Jesus did we are in fact telling them to trust Jesus. And, and they're learning as they practice it that trusting Jesus is a good thing. And so there's sometimes the way we have talked about uh, being saved or trusting Jesus has made doing the good like a second stage affair. But the reality is the good news is Jesus has come doing the good things for us. And if we tell all the stories of the good things Jesus has uh, did and does for us, and then we say these are the good things to do, we are not telling them to earn their way to Jesus. We're telling them to trust that Jesus has the good way. That is putting faith in Jesus. And, 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 I, and sometimes I think we complicate it, and we actually offer a distraction. That then that we have to come in the back door and say, okay, well, now that you've You've said you want to trust Jesus. Now, now let's talk about what that looks like. When parents, we could start out way earlier helping them understand what it looks like to trust Jesus by telling them Jesus stories all the time. Save the stories for uh, th that require a little more abstraction to when they're older and just tell them Jesus stories and associate the things that Jesus did with these are the things that the good does. And the good and love pursues the good, because then you're telling them that this is why Jesus came. God loves us, sent his son. And these are the, this is the way love looks. And if we're going to trust Jesus, then moms and dads, that's how they see it in us. We are pursuing the good, and when we do, we're telling them that this is these are things Jesus did, and because we trust him, we do what Jesus did. And now they're learning what faith looks like, and they don't have to hear us try to figure out how to help them with some abstraction. So I don't know, Paul, that, that just struck me, too, in thinking through that, as, as I told you, I had a mashup of conversations today, because we, we, we do make, we do somehow um, make it hard to have faith. Yeah, and honestly, I think that there's an opportunity that in our doing that it reinforces the gospel mm -hmm. because in my doing, when I am stepping back and evaluating what I did and I think, well, whether it was my motivation wasn't in the right place or um, I just I did something wrong or whatever, well, th that becomes a reminder that, well, guess what? It's not by those things that you are made right with God, and those things you continually fail at, but it is through all of that that God still shows you his love and his grace and his mercy, and so you're still utterly dependent upon him even in your trying, even mm -hmm. because you're trying and you're doing uh, will inevitably result in failing as well. Yeah. It will inevitably, as, I, as I've said multiple times now, our, our motivations are always mixed. Well, that means that there's always some negative motivation that we've got, selfish motivation, whatever it may be. And that just becomes another reminder of, 
you know, I, I don't let that paralyze me because I'm sitting there waiting for the right motivation to act. I act and then I let God deal with my motivations in the midst of all of that and let him come to me and say, you know what? Um, I mean, good job. You, you showed my love uh, to someone else, but you also kind of had uh, a little ego involved here. And, and that's an opportunity for me to say, okay, uh, yeah, you're right. And, uh, but we don't, we don't allow that to paralyze us. We don't mm-hmm. allow it to, to keep us from doing nothing because it's just, that's where we repent and, and we get up and we uh, do it all over again. And, uh, you know, with, the, with prayer and practice and the, uh, the grace of God, then uh, maybe it's different next time in terms of our motivations and whatnot. Yeah, I think maybe um, he 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 has this line. I thought I'd uh, reinforce what Paul's saying here because if if our, let's say our motivation in helping a neighbor is to show we're unselfish, so then our motivation is I'm I, I want to make sure that I'm unselfish. Well, the very fact that I'm doing this so that I can prove that I'm unselfish makes this about me and not my neighbor. So here's what he says: Why would genuinely unselfish people bother trying to be unselfish? I hope you're listening to what he says. Why would genuinely unselfish people bother trying to be unselfish? They're too busy caring about their neighbors, and they don't care about their neighbors in order to show and how, how unselfish or loving they are. They care because they actually love their neighbors. And that's a very different motivation from the desire to be loving and unselfish. So the very desire to be more loving puts the focus on us and not on our neighbor. And the very desire to be unselfish puts our focus on us and not on our neighbor. And if the doing the good is doing the good for fulfilling that second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, then the motivation is your neighbor and not you. And and I think that's really, really helpful when he he, uh, addressed that. And, and, you know, kind of put it in that sort of language, because, um, you know, that's often where we get stuck. And, and then, you know, we've mentioned it, you mentioned it, I mentioned it, and he, he talked about, you know, when we discover those motivations are wrong, we repent. But he had this line, um, that, so penitence, repentance, the repeated practice of discovering what sinners we are is not only good for us, it's crucial. It's a crucial foundation for evangelism because penitence is all about true self-knowledge. That is, if we recognize some bad motivations, bad attitudes, whatever it is that we're really, we're really selfish, trying, trying to be unselfish, uh, recognizing that is actually being more honest with ourselves. And when we tell God, hey, God, that, that, that doesn't belong, and I'm changing my mind about that, then we're being more honest about ourselves than we are when we say, well, I just want to prove that I'm unselfish, because that really is selfishness. And, and so repentance is all, falls on hard times because we, for, we, we're, we are not emphasizing the fact that it is really an expression of real, really knowing ourselves uh, rather than kind of hiding, hiding from ourselves. I just thought I thought that was kind of a good follow on Paul. And then and then um, I think maybe um, the, the one last thing before we uh, uh, um, get ready for worship is, you know, when we're looking for we, we, we are a people who love love slogans and we love we love phrases. We love hooks. I need a hook to help me here. And so you could say, well, I'm going to make the decision uh, to do the good. And I'm going to know that love always seeks the good. But he, he uses a phrase um, that you really find, um, you know, Moses speaking to the people at the end of Deuteronomy. Like, here's, here's what you get to choose. You know, and, and he says, let's choose life. And, and so the good is choosing what's life-giving. And we're choosing what's life-giving for our neighbors. So when we're trying to discern, okay, how do I know what the good thing is? Well, what are the things that you do for your neighbor that can be life-giving for them? And that that becomes a hook when we're developing this sense of 
okay, I want to pursue the good. I, I want I want to always be doing good. And, 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 and I know that love's going to follow and seek after the good. And, and that's the kind of person that I want to be. And I'm, and so how do I arrive at that decision? I need it. I need a hook. And I thought he provided a good one with choose life. Let's choose what's life giving for our neighbors. Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing uh, that I think is related is, so how do I love uh, my neighbor? How do I love others? And uh, we have a tendency to think of it either in terms of how we feel about someone or what we think about them. So even even the idea, and I think it's a good definition of love, that love uh, desires the, the best for another. Uh, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty good definition mm -hmm. of love. But ultimately, we don't become loving people by concentrating on those things. I, I don't sit here and concentrate on, well, Am I am I positively wanting the best for you? Um, we the the way we develop those things, as he mentions in the chapter, is when we find a description of love in First Corinthians thirteen. It isn't about what love thinks or how mm -hmm. love feel what love feels. It's just what it does. Mm -hmm. And so he gives this illustration uh, of parents. And he says, you know, when a parent has a child that gets up in the middle of the night, and this is the fourth or fifth time in the middle of the night, you don't jump up feeling like, oh, I love this child so much <laughs> and having these warm, fuzzy feelings about this child. You're annoyed. You're tired. You may be cranky, but you get up and you do the right thing for them. You comfort them. You feed them. You change them. Whatever's needed in the moment. Uh, because that's what love does. And so 1 Corinthians 13 says, and, and I, I thought it was good that he po uh, pointed out that he's talking to this church in Corinth that has all kinds of internal issues um, uh, of people not being loving toward each other in a variety of ways, uh, whether it's quarrels or factions or whatever that they've created amongst themselves. And so he says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude. Love doesn't seek its own. And, and so he talks about what love does. And, and I think that's a better way of getting at it than trying to think about, well, how should I be thinking about you? You know, what, what are the thoughts that should be going through my mind or what are the emotions that should be going through my heart as I consider how I'm relating to you here? Well, the thoughts may be, this person is really annoying right now. Mm -hmm. And the feelings may be, I don't want to help you, but the action is patience and kindness and not rudeness. And mm -hmm. can you imagine, this is what he's telling the Corinthians to do for one another. Don't be rude to each other. Mm -hmm. Be patient with each other. Be kind to one another. These are the things that are going to develop love among you and, and are going to be a demonstration that love is present among you. And so you just think about those things. In, in doing the good thing, then you are bearing out love in action. And, and it becomes that, again, that external shaping event. And, and two, um, who did all of those perfectly? Jesus did. So doing what Jesus did is the good. It, it is what love does. Um, yeah, that's a whole nother deal. I don't know. Uh, don't want to get you sidetracked because I think you ought to buy this book, but uh, Bob Goff has a book called Love Does, and it's really good, um, emphasizing, you know, okay, here's what love does. Uh, but we, we want to be careful because we can make our own new laws saying, well, Paul, if you're really loving, this is what you'll do. And that's why I think that it, it is important to um, keep the object of our action external. Here's what love does for my neighbor. Because every time I then think, well, here's what love does, then I'm I'm making a list of rules for me, or I'm making a list of rules for you. And that's going to lead me right back down the road of motivation and paralysis and 
uh, us and them because I do that better than you do. And so we always want to remember that what love does is always in relationship to what's outside of us. What's outside of us. That is the incarnation. God's love was expressed externally to we who are outside of God. And, and, and so that's how we are shaped. That's how we're formed. And um, it, it, it is, uh, I, it, we could go on, but we're going to run out of time. So get the book and see how we messed up. That's what you could do. See if we really got it nailed down. So listen, we are uh, about maybe 15, 20 minutes from worship, whether you're going to join us uh, in person or live stream, whichever way, we, we look forward to seeing you. We trust you're well. We, we hope um, you're enjoying the, well, the warmer weather and the sunshine and the getting outdoors and, and you're feeling better. And, and we're just looking for a better future, of course. So, Paul, would you lead us in prayer as we close and prepare for worship? You bet. God, um, teach us how to be relieved of the burdens that we tend to make of our faith. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus told us that uh, he, he called us to come to him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And we tend to complicate those things and we tend to turn easy things into burdensome things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we tend to create situations that create anxiety for ourselves and for one another as we think about how to live faithfully before you. And it's not because we're intending to create those things. It, it just happens. And so uh, we just pray that you would show us what the, the easy and the, the light way is, uh, because that's what we want to follow. And we don't want a faith that is full of all these burdens, because then it just weighs us down and we lose hope. Mm -hmm. um, but you're teaching us that um, we don't have to live with the burdens and we don't have to live with the anxiety, um, but that your way is easy. And so uh, help us to internalize that so that we can joyously follow you uh, as we go about seeking to do good in the world on your behalf so that your love may be known far and wide. Uh, and now we pray that you'll go with us as we go to worship together. Uh, may your presence be very real among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. See you either by live stream or in person. And again, praying for you and trust you're well and hope to see you soon.